Have you ever wondered how our buildings kept us comfortable before the introduction of modern day mechanical systems? What happens when our electricity is compromised or our external circumstances are extreme? These scenarios are becoming increasingly more common. In this video, I'm going to talk to you guys about simple design features that don't cost any extra money to implement and are not just green, but resilient. Let's jump into it. Resilient building design principles I'm going to talk about in this video are passive heating and cooling methods without mechanical means, the amount of glazing, how and where to incorporate thermal mass, calculations for sun angles and overhangs, and common misconceptions of passive house certification and passive solar design. Uh, just a quick disclaimer before I keep going. I'm not suggesting that these are the only systems you use in your building design. I'm only presenting them as a means of resilience. Uh, a building should be adaptable and thus incorporate technology when available. A solar house is one of the oldest strategies for designing a comfortable building. It utilizes design features such as solar orientation, thermal mass, backup heat sources, and natural ventilation. The main component of passive heating is utilizing solar heat. It's free, and that's great. If it's free, it's for me. We want to orient the building facing the equator to capture the, the most winter sun that's going to be low in the horizon. So if you're in the southern hemisphere, that's going to be north, and if you're in the northern hemisphere, that's going to be south. So we want our living areas to be more oriented on that solar gain side and keep our utilities to the north. As you can see in this picture on the left, the most heat is closer to those windows. And as you get further back towards the back of the house, further away from the sun, uh, that's where it starts to get a little bit cooler. Ideally, we want thermal mass to absorb it, hold on to it, and then slowly release it. Um, thermal mass could be anything from concrete, brick, plaster. Thermal mass should not exceed 4 inches. It should be insulated regardless of your climate, um, so he can be released into the building instead of outside of it. Um, and in a passive heating system, we want to have a backup heat source. You think, oh, it's passive heating, so we don't need anything, but, but it's a little bit harder to heat a house. Um, then cool a house. So we want to make sure that we have a backup option. It's a cloudy day or our solar batteries aren't charging, etc. Um, it's a good idea to have a backup heat source. I'm a big proponent of a wood stove. Um, and there is some controversy around this. Since there are some places where they burn too much wood. But I think as a backup option, it makes a lot of sense. Because most places in the world, you can harvest firewood. Passive cooling systems don't require too many backup systems if it's done right. The main features of passive cooling are going to be shading, natural ventilation, and evaporative cooling. Uh, so the big thing with shading is you're going to want to have uh, adequate overhangs to protect from that summer sun. Um, and we'll get into this in a, in a more detailed calculation um, in the coming slides. And the second is ventilation. Uh, because heat rises, we can utilize that pressure difference and siphon the prevailing winds into the home to replace that hot air. Uh, this is also called a chimney effect. Ancient Chinese called these cooling towers sky wells, and they incorporated rainwater catchment, bringing water into the building in a very strategic way. Obviously, you don't want to bring too much water into the building without uh, having proper drainage. Uh, and utilizing the evaporative cooling <coughs> Um, to cool the space. So we'll get into this later with more climate specific design. It's more geared towards hot arid climates, but it is an effective tool regardless. A note on air filtration, we want to refresh stale air with new air all the time, but we want to make sure that it's filtered air if we can. Um, so making sure that we put in air filtration systems, make sure that we're putting in new filters is uh, important, especially if you live in an urban environment or you're living um, in an area with wildfires, etc. Um, the air we breathe is super important to our health. And another cooling effect we have is utilizing uh, the earth. You know, once we get below frost depth, uh, the earth's 
uh, surface is quite regulated in temperature. So there's what's called a ground source heat pump and that um, has pipes going under the ground and then utilizing the heat pump technology. You can also go the route of using an earth mass, although this is a little bit more tricky when it comes to insulating and waterproofing those walls. So the right amount of glazing um, is often overdone. What we think of when we think about a solar house is typically a lot of windows. Um, and that's not really the case. 7% is not that much. So if you look at this picture down here in the lower left, um, you're going to see uh, a house that's actually to scale. Um, it's a thousand square feet. Um, you'll see the windows are facing that equator side, south or north, depending on your hemisphere. And if it's a thousand square feet, that means that the 7% would be 70 square feet of windows. Um, so as you can see, it's not as many windows as you think. And there is one stipulation. If if you look at, we'll go to the next slide here. If you look at um, Earthships, for example, you notice they have a whole greenhouse on the south side. And the only way they're able to get away with that without overheating is they have a whole earth burn behind the house. Um, and so that's, that's accounting for thermal mass. So the more thermal mass you have, um, you can have more glazing. Um, and the rule of thumb is that no more than 11% Otherwise, it gets tricky. Um, you have to make sure you have the adequate cooling systems in place. Um, it can be done, but as a rule of thumb, do not go over 11%. Um, so if you increase your thermal mass and you, you can calculate that, you can increase your glazing. So the sun's angle, uh, unless you live on the equator, is constantly moving. Uh, so we need to determine the extents of where the sun's going to travel and thus determine the, the, the winter solstice and the summer solstice angle. So we can see the range of where the sun is gonna be hitting our house. And if we're incorporating this overhang, um, we, can, we can align these angles um, to determine the, where our window is going to sit. Um, in the winter, we, wanna, we want it to flood our homes and luckily it's lower in the horizon so if you look at the green dashed line over here on the left, um, that'll be indicating the winter solstice. It will need to bypass that overhang and almost hit the header of that window, allowing maximum heat through the windows. In the summer, alternatively, we don't want any sun coming in, so the overhang needs to block it completely. Um, we can adjust uh, the sill height and the overhang width, like the width of, you know, the overhang could be wider and the sill lower, but we just want to make sure that no sun enters the house on the summer solstice. Once we have these angles, we can adjust the sill height and head height of the windows, as well as the overhang, depending on which element pri has priority. For example, if you have a standard window size already, you're going to have to adjust that overhang to uh, meet the criteria of the windows. So here's how you do it. Calculating these angles are super simple once you know what latitude you're at. And the constant, the control, is the Earth's tilt, which is 23.5 degrees. So basically for the summer solstice, you're gonna take your latitude minus the Earth's tilt, which is 23.5, and then subtract that from 90. In the same way, you're gonna do the winter solstice, but you're going to um, add together the latitude with the Earth's tilt and then subtract that from 90. And that'll give you winter and summer solstice angles. So there are four major climates I want to talk about. Hot, arid, cold, temperate, and hot, humid. I first want to emphasize the importance of site-specific design. These are not cookie cutter concepts. And this does not apply for every site that you're on regardless of the climate. This is nearly a tool to explain some climate specific principles. Architects around the world know these guidelines, it's a part of the ARE exam, and yet I still see similar modern styles that continue to be built despite the climate considerations. These styles are not just aesthetic, uh, there's a functionality behind them, so let me explain. So this first one is hot arid. Um, and the most important part of uh, a hot arid house is it's got to incorporate a lot of thermal mass. Thermal mass on the interior, thermal mass on the exterior. 
The temperatures are extreme. If you think about a desert, it's really hot during the day, really cold at night. So we really want to level out those extremes by slowly releasing the heat and the cool when we need it. And we don't want a lot of windows. Um, there's a lot of sun. If any, you're going to put them on that, again, that equator facing side. Um, there's not many trees or a lot of shading in desert climates, so you want to make sure that you have ample shading um, and overhang over those windows. And another fun little feature of hot and arid climates is creating a courtyard with some kind of pool in the central location. In a dry climate, that water will evaporate to allow for evaporative cooling to take place. Typically, fans will be placed above a pool to, to suck that evaporating water through the space. And the last thing is we want to make sure that the building is a uh, light exterior, almost white, to reflect any heat um, coming into the building or being absorbed into the wall. So with hot, humid houses, we want to make sure that we maximize those overhangs. Um, typically, in a humid climate, there's going to be a lot of rain. Um, so the more overhang we have, the better to protect those walls. It also allows us a little bit indoor-outdoor flexibility. Um, another main feature of a hot and humid house is going to be cross ventilation. You're going to want to know where those prevailing winds are. You're going to want to have operable windows opposite facing to make sure that you can have a breeze blowing through. I lived in Maui for eight years and you know, there were some buildings that just did not have, did not access those prevailing winds. Um, and it was a huge bummer. You want to have light materials and exterior finishes similar to the hot, arid climate, but not as extreme because really we're going to um, maximize those overhangs. You're going to want to have high ceilings to let that hot air rise up to the top and vent out. A lot of times you'll see, which I don't have drawn in this picture, but you you could have like a Dutch gable. So in a cold climate, you want to have a compact form, almost like a cube. That would be the best to have a cube. Um, here I have a, uh, a steeper pitched roof. Um, in some climates, it makes sense to have that for, for rain or for snow, um, although that's up for debate. Uh, I know in, in Alaska, they like to keep the snow on the buildings to act as more insulation, which totally makes sense. Um, but regardless, uh, the other feature would be having a maximum interior thermal mass wall or thermal mass walls. Um, you're going to want to have dark exterior finishes. Again, you're going to want to have south-facing windows with those overhangs. Now, in a temperate climate, we're going to want to have a longer, more linear uh, building that is facing the south or that equator-facing side. Medium finishes on the exterior are fine. Um, one of the key features in a temperate climate is that we want to actually favor the southeast. Um, so a lot of times we'll actually have like a, uh, an angle to the southeast um, to bring in the heat in the beginning of the day when we most need it and then shade out the western sun. And we definitely want to maximize that, that western overhang. By that time of day, by the, the afternoon, the building is already heated up. Um, we can shade that side. The, the sun is hot. We're done with it. So you can put some trees over there, anything like that, um, to shade that side of the building. So I want to talk about understanding the difference between passive house and passive solar. Um, I think people get these confused a lot. They hear the word passive and they think they have a, an image in their head, typically of a passive solar design. But a lot of people are referring to passive house. So passive house is a certification program that uses meticulous calculations for thermal efficiency. Um, they're keen on air tightness to prevent heat loss um, using uh, super efficient air barriers. Um, and you know, monitoring that. Um, they want to make sure that the thermal boundaries are continuous. Um, so that would be insulation basically with no thermal bridging. So thermal bridging is when um, there's a gap or a change in, in the insulative uh, barrier, whether that's a steel beam, a wood stud, um, etc. So 
They're going to also look at high performance windows and doors. They're going to have an emphasis on heat pumps, utilizing um, HRVs, heat recovery ventilators, and ERVs, is depending on your climate, uh, for ventilation. Um, and they also calculate air change uh, per hour. Uh, so they'll do blower door tests and determine how efficient this, this envelope is, how tight is it. On the other hand, uh, passive solar design principles, it's not a certification program. Um, we're concerned with orientation, optimized for solar gain. We're gonna utilize the glass and mass uh, approach that will utilize correct amount of glazing and thermal mass in combination. Um, there's going to be minimal mechanical heating and cooling to reduce reliance on mechanical systems consideration and respect for climate specific design um, with the correct amount of insulation, ventilating, and convection concepts. In my opinion, passive solar takes the cake in terms of resiliency. It has the capacity to be more adaptable and resilient, more so than a passive house. Passive house, if you don't have your mechanical system running and operating um, correctly, uh, you're kind of SOL. So um, that's one main feature. But the other feature is that a passive solar house um, with its thermal mass and site-specific design can utilize local and natural materials, where I think with a passive solar approach, you have to use a lot more synthetic materials, air barriers, etc to make it efficient. The use of local and natural materials is more viable in a passive solar approach, um, given the amount of thermal mass that's utilized, um, not requiring such an airtight building envelope, um, allowing for nature to do the work. Um, a passive solar solution, I think, is a lot more durable, given you know it's a solution that has been proven to work throughout history. The first passive house was built in 1991. So this building modality has only been around 30 years versus passive solar design principles have been used since ancient times with cave dwellings such as Mesa Verde and other um, types of cliff homes. Thanks for watching today. Uh, please click that subscribe button if you like this video. Um, I'll be sure to make you more. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, my website is listed here as well, as well as in the description. I'll be releasing a new newsletter, a uh, weekly newsletter coming up here, talking about resilient design that utilizes reverence, respect, and responsibility in its design principles and how we can move forward to a better future. Thank you.